What day is it? That's right. Today is the day the Lord has made, because that's what the Word says, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. How many glad people in the house today? Ah, uh, come on. Sun's shining. You're here. You made it. And there's a lot of good-looking people in the house, so lots to be thankful for. Uh, welcome. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome home. You know, it's always fun meeting new friends out on the patio. And I get it. It's really hard to come in when it's so nice outside. But trust me, you're going to get all afternoon outside. And if you have a motorcycle, you're welcome to come ride with me this afternoon. Uh, if you're watching online, because now we are live online. I'm still trying to figure it out in the first service. I'm greeting everyone online like, wait a minute, we're not even live. But we are live now. Uh, so I can say hi. Now it's even later for everyone in Africa that's watching. Did you know that people are watching in Kenya and Rwanda? So cool. We got Victory Churches all around the world that are joining in and in, in this service. And it's just cool. East Coast, you know, West Coast. And, and then, of course, you guys. Uh, we've got our friends that we always love to give a shout out to. We love to give a shout out to our community. And one that we lift up is Ruth and Naomi's. Can we give Ruth and Naomi's and the staff a big shout out? There's so many that even serve here in this church that are part of that. There's a team that goes down every other week. We got Dave doing peer work in the street, look, looking super fly in his 300. Like, come on, you're representing well for the kingdom, bro. Big time. You know, um, then we've also got um, Westminster Ladies. We've got, uh, yeah, let's give it up for the ladies. Come on. Uh, the Joshua House, of course. Hi, guys, at the Joshua House. You know, technology, they're 45 minutes up the hill, but living life in discovery, not just recovery. And that should, be, that should be a word for all of us today. Let's live life in discovery. Let's discover something new about who God says we are, what God wants to do in us and through us. Let's discover something fresh today. That's my word for this morning is fresh, something fresh for you. I said, I was backstage just praying, God, give us something fresh in your word today. Who needs something fresh? Yes, good stuff. All right. Um, and then we've got um, Wagner Hills, right? Yes, friends at Wagner Hills. I think the list goes on. Am I missing somebody? All the others. Whoever you are, God has placed you on purpose for a purpose. He's put greatness inside of you, and he's calling you out today. Come on, he's calling you out today. Call somebody out next to you and say, God's got greatness in you. Come on. God's got greatness in you. Turn to the next person and say, I know. Get ready. <laughs> All right, let's go. So we are we are in part three of the hunt. Part three of the hunt, the Easter hunt, just around the corner. They're going to be like, what, a thousand eggs the kids are doing? A thousand egg Easter hunt. Like, it's just on a whole nother level. But in this series, The Hunt, we are in week three. And as we get closer to Easter and the celebration of the greatest event in history, by the way, is when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Because Paul said, if it were not for the resurrection, everything we're doing here would be in vain. There'd be no point. But it's because of the eyewitnesses. It's because of the testimonies. It's because we serve a living God right here, right now, who is alive and active and moving in our community, in our hearts, and our homes. Right? And so when we do this, you know, in this series in Easter, it gives us a chance to do a little bit of an inventory. An inventory in our hearts. That's where we always need to start. Inventory in our lives. Some of the things that we hold on to. Maybe some of the things that we've been looking for, searching for. And before we focus so much on the what, we should always start with the who, right? And God is, he's, he's looking for you. Are you looking for him? Because we just had that verse on the screen, Matthew 7, it says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open unto you. God's just waiting for you. He's waiting for you. And I believe that there's other people here in this house that you've been waiting on God. You've just been waiting on God. But you know what? God's waiting on you. He's waiting to release you, to get you to know who it is he's called you to be. If you are just willing to lay some stuff down, I tell you what God asks of us versus what he gives us, no comparison. Just look it up all through the Bible. Anytime God asks someone to lay something down or give something up, he always has something greater. So we talked about in the, in the first teaching, we talked about again where to look, 
We studied the history of Jesus revealing himself to his followers. And at first he made himself so that they couldn't recognize him. And there was a purpose for that. And how many times is God right there with us? Walking along with us, just like we read last week in Luke 24, and we don't even recognize him. But he's there all along. I shared that cute poem with you about the, the footsteps in the sand, remember? Uh, and that, and then Jesus is having a conversation with somebody and showing him the footsteps. There's two sets of footprints in the sand. And then all of a sudden they see there's only one set of footprints and the person says to Jesus, well, Lord, uh, where were you when I needed you the most? You see, there's only one set of footprints. And, he, and Jesus said, well, when you saw one set, that's when I was carrying you. Come on. God is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. All right? And so Jesus, when he approaches his followers on the road to Amimaeus, one of the things he asks them, he says, what are you talking about? And that was convicting to me. Because if Christ were to ask you right now, what have your conversations been about? Have they been about Christ or have they been about the chaos? They've been about celebrating, right? Or have they been about worry? Okay, oh, well, let's change that, brother. <laughs> right? Because what you focus on is what you give power to. Right? And I'm going to give praise where praise is due. And, you know, how else are we going to live up in a down world if all we're doing is looking down and not looking up? Right? So that's my heart for you this morning is that, that you would get that fresh word, that you would be inspired through the word of God today, and he would speak to you and give you the word that you've been waiting for. Are you ready? Right on. Well, in week two, we had Dr. Hazel Hill in the house. Whoa, did she bring the word? She brought it, you know, for a spring chicken. She's just still rocking. I'm still trying to keep up with her. She's traveling all around the world, doing ministry here, there, everywhere, you know, and she's just full of Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. And man, she just lights the room up. I watched as she prayed over women. As soon as she laid hands on them, they're falling over. You know, they couldn't even stay up because there's just so much anointing on that woman. But it's a willingness. You know, God doesn't always call the qualified, but he calls those that are willing. And are you willing to be used by God? I'm telling you, I'm an example. God will use anyone if we're just willing, right? But in week two, she really challenged us. She said, you know, uh, in the pursuit of the hunt, she says, without God, everything's vanity. And I would add to that because our God is a God of victory. Without victory, it's all vanity. And if you're just fighting for your own victory instead of from a place of victory that can only come through the Lord, it's all vanity. Because Ecclesiastes 3, Solomon, the wisest and richest man that ever lived, said this, without God, it's meaningless. In the Hebrew, the word is havel, which means like grabbing smoke or vapor. And we know this to be true because we see professional athletes, we see superstars that seem to have it all. They've got the fame, they've got the fortune. Why are they committing suicide? Why are they so depressed? Because without God, it's meaningless. Hey, God wants to bless you and make you a blessing. And I said this to someone on the patio, he wants us to have stuff, he just doesn't want the stuff to have you. Right? That's because he's a good God. He, he comes so that we can have life and life more abundantly, right? But sometimes it's just a matter of priorities. And that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. But she challenged us. She said, a soul under God's control involves both mind, will, and emotion. Ho! Mind, will, and emotion. God wants all of you, not just some of you. He doesn't want just this part of you. He wants all of you, right, James? Yeah. Mind, will, and emotion. Some of us, you know, we don't mind. Some of us, we we're so strong-willed. And some of us, we just can't get a hold of our emotions. Our emotions got a hold of us. Right? <laughs> but that's all right. God still uses us and loves us anyway. Praise God. Right? Well, today is Palm Sunday. It's a day of celebration. It commemorates the entrance of Christ into Jerusalem. And I love the way that Jesus showed up. You know, because Jesus was, was a God that did different and people experienced different. He showed up in ways that no one thought that he would show up. He spent time with people that no one would spend time with, right? And he broke so many religious man-made rules. I love that about Jesus. 
He just messed with the culture. He just messed with the method because he had something greater, and that was a message. And he came for everyone. So on Palm Sunday, Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. A donkey. We'll get into that. <laughs> Why a donkey? Well, hee haw. You'll, you'll, you'll feel fine out. But so, and they're laying down these palm branches, and there's, and all the men and women are shouting, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. And he makes this grand entrance. And so he paves the way to a path where his calling was the cross. So he's coming in and he's bringing peace. Peace. The word Hosanna actually means save. Save. And how many of you know that we need saving from ourselves? Save. Save us, Lord. Hosanna. Save you. Save us. You know, in ancient times, palm branches um, had significant meaning. They, they represented goodness and they represented victory. So it wasn't just a random branch they were laying down. They had purpose. Everything we do, we should do on purpose for a purpose. There's meaning behind it if you just take the time to look into it. People laid them down in front of Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem, showing us that his journey was always about the cross. How many of you know that your calling is never convenient? And there's going to be challenges. With every calling, there's going to be a challenge. Guaranteed! Especially when you start headed in the right direction. Sometimes bad things are happening to you because you're doing the right thing. I know that's not always the case, but you start working on your relationship. You start going to church and then other distractions come in, other discouragements. You try to get divided, disengaged. Why? Because you were never a threat to the enemy before. Before you came to know Jesus, before you started to work on your relationship with him and with others, the biggest threat, the biggest enemy was in you. Satan just stepping back like, yo, I don't got to do nothing. She just beats herself up all the time, talks down about himself all the time, says that he's worthless, that he's less than, that he's, that he's, that he's whatever, fill in the blank. Whatever negative thing that you've been speaking over yourself, life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those that love it will eat its fruit. But you start stepping in your calling. Come on. All of a sudden, you experience different battles. But you're not the same. If you've got Jesus in you, you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And once you get that Jesus juice in you, you know what I'm talking about? That super in your natural, you know what I'm talking about. It's like you got faith like a child. You feel like, woo, I'm just on fire. I can do anything. Yeah, well, he can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. All things. You get that fire on you, well, guess what? The enemy gets upset too. Every day you wake up in the morning, he's like, oh, crap. She's up again. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But with that comes battles. You can't have a victory without a battle. And every battle is going to come with barriers that you're going to get to break through. And every breakthrough is going to come with a blessing and then a bigger battle. You know where I'm going with this. Right? The bigger the battle, the bigger the breakthrough. Let's go. The bigger the blessing. Come on. Come on. Come on, church. Mm. I'm telling you, the bigger the anointing, the bigger the attacks. But once you recognize it, and if you know that God is for you, then who can be against you? You know you've already won. And you can go about every day living life through victory, not trying to fight it or earn it, but fighting from a place of victory because your God has overcome sin and death and overcame the grave. Because even though there was a Friday with a crucifixion, Sunday's coming. There's a resurrection coming. Right? And that's what we're getting geared up to celebrate. Next week's going to be Easter Sunday. We're going to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. But why wait to celebrate? Today's the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. So, let's get to the Word, and let's witness how Jesus enters in and how he just rocks everybody's world and fulfills a prophecy that was written over 500 years ago about him showing up on a donkey. Yeah, look it up. Zechariah 9, 9. The prophet Zechariah prophesied this. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king come to you. He's coming for you. He's coming for you. You got reason to celebrate. 
See your king, he comes to you righteous, victorious, but lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. I can almost hear the men and women shouting in the streets, Hosanna, Hosanna. Save, save, save. You know, one of the greatest battles that we will face is the search for peace. Isn't that true? I mean, how many of you need some more inner peace? You can use some more inner peace. Ah, well, that's the presence of Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. And that's what he came to do. And you know, with that, though, with that, if you want something, you got to be willing to surrender something. You got to be willing to lay something down. You want God to pick you up, you got to be willing to lay something down. I want to challenge us today to lay down something that is external for something that is internal. You know, the Bible challenges us on three things that we're all going to struggle with. And that is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Man, we're all going to struggle with that. But what are you going to do about it? Will you surrender to the Lord? Will you lay it down on his feet? Will you cast your cares and burdens at his cross? Will you say it is finished? Will you get up and look to him and move towards him? Will you you start to see people, not so much as the old, but as the new? That if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Will you start to look at them as a new creation? Will you start to look at your life as a new creation? Because that's going to have an effect on how you treat yourself and how you treat others. Because what you perceive is what you receive. Do you see a masterpiece sitting next to you, Ephesians 2.10? I do. I see masterpieces all around here because that's what God's word says, says that you are a masterpiece created in Christ to do wonderful things that he planned for you long ago. So let's get to God's word. Which gospel are we in, Luke? I think we're in Luke. Luke 19. They all, they all say the same thing, different perspectives. Luke 19, uh, if you brought your Bibles with you, why don't you hold them up? If they glow, it's always cool when they're glowing in the house. Yeah, you've got your phone with you. Well, we got to help the back row. That's all right. It's all right. If you go go to your phone, there's an app on there um, called YouVersion. You can use that. You can follow along. And yes, you have permission. Let's try that one more time. You got a phone with you? Hold it up. There we go. All right. So... I challenge you not to just believe me because I'm the pastor and I said it. Get into God's word for yourself. See if it's true. Because man, if I can convince you of one thing, somebody else can convince you of another. It's God's word that will set you free. It's his truth that will set you free. It says that his word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. How have you been stumbling and tripping over yourself lately? Come on. Well, this is your light. It is active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it reveals things that are deep within that nobody else can see, but God sees it. And that's why some of you right now, you're going to walk out of the room today, and you're going to be like, yo, how did he know? Well, God knows. Pastor, it was like you're preaching straight to me. No, God's preaching for you. He's got a word for you. And every time you get into his word, it, it speaks life into you. It's relevant. So let's start here. Um, Actually, I'm going to start in verse 29. Ah, Let's go 28. Let's keep going back. Amen. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethsage of Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives. Okay, I'm going to park here for a minute. This is just, this is a total maybe random thought, but it's going to speak to somebody. There's so much significance in the Mount of Olives, okay? It is still today, traditionally for the Jews, a sacred place. And all olives represent peace. And olive oil was used to anoint kings. Like it's not, you can't just read past and miss what Jesus is doing in the place that he's in and why he's in in the place that he's in. Right now there's over 250,000 graves at the Mount of Olives right now. Because believe, there are Jews that believe that Jesus is coming back. Well, we all believe he's coming back. But the first place that the, the, the dead will rise will be at that place. It's significant. To many people, it just looks like a graveyard, but to others, it's sacred. How many things in your life seem dead but are still sacred to God? He's not done with you yet. 
He's about, he's going to turn a relationship into a resurrection story. I feel it. But olives. So we had um, Olive and Eve, Evie, up front here. I don't know if you know Olive and Evie, but if you were here in the first service. So there's Danny here. She's worshiping for the first time on our stage. Olive and Eve, Evie are, were up front worshiping. You know, they're looking at mom. And I was just like, Evie just kept like doing this, turning around her sister, hugging her, doing this, turning around her sister, hugging her. And I was just a mess because I'm like, oh God, this is so you. And this is so what you want of us. A heart that is authentic to worship you. You know, Jesus called the little children forward and he says, the kingdom of God belongs to these. Unless you have faith like a child and humble yourself like a child, you won't enter in the kingdom of God. And some of us use that, lose that childlikeness because we get so caught on the journey that we miss Jesus. But you can see it in our kids, the way that they worship. It's in their name. Well done, parents. I see Sheldon and Danny right there. Well done. So go to the village ahead of you, Jesus said, and enter into it. And guess what? He says, you're going to find a cult. One that which has uh, never been ridden, by the way. You're going to untie it. You're going to bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it, the Lord, you're going to say the Lord needs it. Hey, try that out next time. I'm going to go to Harley Davidson. I'm going to look for a new bike, you know, tied up, never been ridden before. Lord has need of it. <laughs> yeah, probably not going to work unless the Lord is calling you to do that. Right? Come on. But anyway, I think it's brand new. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. First point is, the Lord has need of us. And he ha we've got stuff, not just our scraps, not just the junk, but we've got some stuff that's dear to us that we've never let anybody touch yet. It's brand new, and God wants to use it. Never been used before, never ridden before. I picked on Rick this morning. I'm like, Rick, imagine, you know, you get that brand new Harley and you just, you pick up showroom, no one's ridden it, you haven't even ridden it, and you're like, yo, Jesus is saying, I wanna ride that bike, I have need of it. True story. Another story, a different story, I'm full of stories. I had a friend call me up. Friend out east, he calls me up and he says, Pastor Matt, he says, the Lord has been telling me to give my stuff up. He's told me to give my business up. Come on. He's told me to give up some of the things that I really love, some of these material things, because he wants to bless me and he wants to do something new in my life. And I said, wow, that's cool. And he said, I had a conversation with God as I walked past my Harley. The Lord said, what about that? And I said to him, no, Lord, that's my baby. And the Lord said, no, that's my baby. And so he said, I want to, do you know of somebody that, that, that could be blessed by this, that's in a tough season right now, that would use it for my kingdom, that is in the ministry, involved in the church, come on. And I just happened to know somebody at the time that had given up his Harley because he needed to pay the bills and was in a tough season. He serves in this church. He loves the Lord. Him and his wife have given up house and home to be here. I said, I know somebody. Come on, I know somebody. And so... That person is, is blessed today because of that. I flew out east. I'm like, if you're serious about that, I'll fly out. We'll ride this thing back. I'm telling you, the whole ride back, I'm worshiping God like this, not just because it's got ape hangers, right? But I'm like, oh, Jesus. I'm just like smiling ear to ear, and I, I'm just the delivery boy, right? All the glory to God. And he specifically said, don't tell him who I am. Just said this is from, say this is from God. This is from God. Guess who gets the glory then? God gets the glory. Guess who gets blessed? My friends get blessed. Isn't that cool? But the Lord has need of it. What is it that you've got that God wants to use? What is that that you've been holding on to, maybe even coveting, that you're like, oh, but God, not this. That's my baby. He says, no, 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 no. It's all mine. Anytime God asks you for something, he's always going to outgive you. There's no way you can outgive God. Show of hands. Anybody believe in that? Anybody given and God has given? Look at the hands all up in the house. We've been blessed with vehicles. We've been blessed with homes. Hey, honey, you can't out give God. But guess what? He's always going to challenge you on another level. You know, like what, what might be big for you to give isn't big for another person to give. But, you know, even you might have little, but it seems much to you. But I'm telling you, little is much when God is in it. All you got to do is lay it down at his feet. So what do you got? If you think of anything, write it down. Actually, those cards in front of you, use those. I'm going to collect those after. Watch, God's going to do something cool. So there's cards right in front of your seat. You can take any one of those cards, start scribbling, scratching on there. And if there's something you need to lay down, you don't have to put your name on it. 
Just write it down. Because sometimes this is an act of faith and an act of obedience. One, Habakkuk 2, 2 says, write the vision down, make it plain so those that read it can run with it. Some of the reason that you're not running right now, you haven't even written it down. And I'm all I'm going to give you a setup today. Just, just write it down and give it to God. As an act of God to God later on when the baskets come around, just drop that thing in, believe it in faith. God, I lay this down at your feet. I lay my relationship down before you. I lay my finances down before you. It's all yours. What do you want to do with it? I'm, I'm not saying go empty your bank accounts right now. That's not what I'm saying, just to be clear. I'm just saying the heart, God is after your heart. He's not after your wallet. What is it that you can lay down? What do you have that the Lord needs? So again, this, this scripture mentions, you know, this, this donkey. Why a donkey? Why not a horse, a stallion, you know? like It's like, again, it's right, Rick? It's like picking the, the heritage versus the sports. Well, let's not even say Harley. Let's, let's just do a little a Vespa. Let's say like, <laughs> you know, like, or your Ferrari versus your Fiat, you know? Like, <laughs> what is it? You know, why, Lord, why'd you come in on a Ferrari? Everyone would have known. What you mean? You, you, you own all the cattle. You, own all, you could have had the best of the best when you rode in. And he's like, son, I do everything on purpose for a purpose. First, we must understand that it was, it was a tradition when introducing a new king to its subjects. The king would come riding in, but because there was a new king, a lot of the times the king would come riding in on the previous king's horse or Harley, (laughs) or Ferrari, right? To indicate that there was a transfer of rulership. Now, Jesus had his disciples bring him an unridden, come on, colt. Why? Because his kingship didn't come from man. It came from God the Father. He's making a point. And I was curious, you know, Jesus, like, I know that you, you know, you're king of kings, lord of lords. You can speak to the fish and they'll do whatever you want to do, but... Um, You know, a donkey that's never been broken in, like that's got to be a pain in the you-know-what. It's in the Bible. The pain in the donkey, (laughs) right? That's got to be a pain in the... Yeah, so I'm like, I'm just, you know, this is where my mind goes. So I'm like, how do you... I've never owned a donkey. I've never really desired to own a donkey. But I'm like, how do you break in a donkey? So I look it up. uh, and the research, All the research I found is you don't break in a donkey. A donkey will break you. Okay, the truth is the truth is this: you don't break in a donkey, you don't break in a, a mule. They have to agree to follow you on their own will. You can't force it. Isn't that like us? And God doesn't force Himself on us. We have to come on our own free will. Love is a choice. Love is a verb. Jesus can lay His life down for you, and He did. It's still up to you whether you will receive that relationship. Some people have such a hard time believing that. Why would a God do that for me? Because he loves you. And it's so hard to fathom in our head. But when you come to the place of surrender and you lay yourself down, your pride down, and that hardened heart down, you open your, you're a mess. Because when Jesus comes in, you know with a shadow of a doubt that you are loved. And it's so overwhelming. But you know that you know and you freely, just as he gave his life to you, you give your life to him. Because nothing else compares. No drug compares. No relationship compares when you have that revelation of a real relationship with Jesus. So apparently donkeys and mules, they're extremely intelligent. Actually more intelligent than horses. Uh, A horse will basically do whatever you ask them uh, to do. You can break in a horse, no problem. I've actually been part of that. It's a lot of fun. You know, you teach them to ride and get to know you. They buck you off a couple of times. And you Yellowstone it and you feel like you're really cool and you move on. Right? And once you got them, you got them. But a donkey will not put themselves in a dangerous situation for a human. Did you know that? They take their own safety very seriously. They put their safety first. And a human trying to, to, to break in a donkey or a mule will not win that contest. I'm sure we've all heard the saying, as stubborn as a mule. Well, it's extremely accurate. And we can be like that. And trying to break in a mule, a, a donkey only is going to make them bad. I'm mad and bad. <laughs> Right? 
But isn't it amazing how God speaks to us and approaches us and loves us and comes to us and how the Holy Spirit speaks to us in such a loving way, not a condemning way? It's like, hey, I love you. I got more for you. You know, you could do that. But I'll still be here for you. And there's nothing that you're going to do that's going to separate me from my love that I have for you. But isn't it the Jesus approach, his style, just even coming in on a donkey. You know, they were expecting this warrior to come on in. Take down the Romans, take care of everything, you know, and he comes in peace. For Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but he came to save the world. He's actually given the name Prince of Peace. It's really cool. They, 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 they bring this donkey to Jesus. Then they throw their, their, their cloaks, their coats on the colt. And they put Jesus on it. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, let's make a saddle. And as he goes along, people in the city start all spreading down their coats on the ground. You imagine that? They're like, and like, this has huge significance. Now, some of us may own more than one coat. Some of us might have a closet. Yeah, I know, honey. We just, last year we did that coat thing. We clothed the homeless and then somehow all of our coats multiplied and recovered. But you can imagine that, you know, all these people putting down their Gucci coats or, or, or whatever and laying them down for Jesus' donkey to go over. And, you know, stuff comes out of donkeys. But they did that on, on purpose for a purpose. And so what are you willing to lay down for Jesus? What's significant in this scripture and why laying down their coats? Well, one, this was an act of honor. This was also acknowledging and declaring that Jesus was the King of Kings and the promised Messiah. And now the Jews of that day wore two principal garments, an interior coat or a tunic and an outer garment and a more costly exterior cloak that was the outer garment. And that's what they would have laid down. And this cloak was used not only as a jacket or an outer covering during the day, but it was also uh, acted as a blanket and a coat to cover them at night. Isn't that neat? That's just a what is something significant. It's got so much meaning to them in their life. It was it, it was uh, security. It was protection. It kept them warm. And by Mosaic law, the outer coat was a sacred possession that couldn't even be withheld from a debtor. They couldn't withhold the coat overnight. If you read Exodus 22, 26 to 27, it says, if you take your neighbor's coat as a pledge, return it to them by sunset. Verse 27 says, because that cloak is the only uh, covering your neighbor has. What else can they sleep in? And then it says, when they cry out to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. Cool, eh? And Deuteronomy 24, 12 to 13 says, if your neighbor is poor, do not go to sleep with their pledge in your possession. Whew. Return their cloak by sunset so that your neighbor may sleep in it, and then they will thank you, and it will be regarded as a righteous act in the sight of the Lord God. It wasn't just the jacket, guys. It had significant meaning. It was, that's the value. They could hold that as a debt. So when they were laying something down, they weren't laying something insignificant. They were laying something quite significant. As an act of laying down their coats, they were also saying that they were willing to give up what was rightfully theirs. And ultimately, we're rightfully his. I mean, so again, there's no comparison to what we lay down at the foot of Jesus to what he offers us. Freedom, salvation, eternity. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans and purposes I have for you, declares the Lord. I know the plans I have for you, Josh plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. I know the plans I have for you, Mike. You can say your own name in there. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. If you know God's plans, you'll start to trust him through the process. Because there will be highs and lows. There will be valleys. And I did, I did another cool, I did two weddings on the weekend, by the way, back to back. And one of the weddings was uh, it's a beautiful wedding. And I'm not going to do it justice, but in the vows, one of the vows was, I promise to stand with you in the valleys, and I also promise to stand with you on the mountaintops. You see, victory is in the valley. 
We don't always see it when we're there, but where do we need God the most? When you're going through the dark times in your life, when you can't see a way out, He's there. Even though you walk through the darkest valley, He will be there with you. His rod and His staff, they comfort you. The darkest valley, you can find victory. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, says, Do you not know? So when you're laying down your coat, God is saying, yo, I want all of you, not just some of you, not just part of you. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? When I talk about an exchange, it's always good exchange with God, just so you know. Great exchange. Anyone who gives up house and home or family for my sake will re receive a hundredfold in this lifetime and the next. We lay down some things that seem so significant to us, but what God offers us is so much greater. So he's saying your body is a body. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. When you receive Jesus, when you receive the Holy Spirit, that Matthew 7, 7, that's regarding the Holy Spirit. All you got to do is ask. All you got to do is ask. But that goes, well, you don't lose that. Holy Spirit goes with you. God goes with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And it's, it continues to say that you are not your own. You were bought for a price. You know, that verse has helped me so many times. In the past, when I've struggled with the flesh, anything in the flesh, and I realized, wait a minute, this isn't, this isn't my body. My body was bought for a price. How I treat it, I want to be like Paul says, you know, I want to put I want to put that thing into submission. I want to run like an athlete so that, you know, that I, that I don't disqualify myself after preaching. You know, fitness is important to us. We're going to do a series on it. Health is important to us. Mental health, physical health. This is your body like you want to go. Come on. How many want to go the distance? Come on. I do. I still want to be able to to wrestle my kids. I still want to be able to beat Aiden in arm wrestling. You know, so far I think I'm winning. I don't I don't know how you're doing with Connor. Here. Easy? Easy. All right. <laughs> Let's go, Dad. You know, but I want to give my wife the best version of me. I don't want her to have the scraps at the end of the day. And I lean into the word to remind me, whoa, this body's not my own. It was bought for a price. It's here to serve you. It's here to serve my family. It's here to serve my community. This is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not gonna allow junk in. Let's go. But back to the things that we cover ourselves with, back to the things that we value. Yeah, for the Jews, it was, it was traditionally known as a spiritual symbol also of, of creating a sacred place of inner healing. And you look all throughout the Bible. I shared that this morning, like all throughout the Bible where, where a coat was placed on somebody and people were healed. You know, it was also a, a transfer of, of anointing. Elijah comes up to Elisha and throws the coat over. Here you go, honey. Oh. <laughs> That's literally what he did as an act. He took his outer coat on and he placed it on Elisha, who, by the way, was just in the field minding his own business, bull butts all day long. He's working the field, following bull, stepping in bull, living in bull, you know, just doing what he's called to do in the moment. And guess what? God showed up. Sometimes you just got to be faithful doing what you're doing where you're at. And it's not, you know, like God's going to meet you where you're at. Come on. And you might be day in, day out looking at the same thing. But keep your eyes on him. There's significance in what we lay down. There's significance in what we cover ourselves with. There's significance in what we lay before the foot of the cross. And we lay down our coverings for Jesus. We don't just receive inner peace, but the Prince of Peace. Verse 37. James, you're doing a great job, by the way. James Ponak in the back there. It says, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, I've mentioned that, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices. Don't go to church and be quiet all the time. Come on. There you go. Don't, 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 don't live your life quiet all the time. You got to speak up for the right things. The enemy would love to shut you up and shut you out. Speak truth, speak love. The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. 
Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Finally, third point, rejoice. I'm going to tell you why. Because of the promise of peace and reconciliation. This was heavy on my heart when I was studying God's word. There's some of us that are waiting on God and God's been waiting on you for reconciliation. Some of us have given up our peace to other people. You know, Jesus, when he sent out his disciples, he told them to go into the homes and say, speak peace over that home if they were received. And if that home was didn't receive them in peace, that they were supposed to wipe the dust off their feet and carry on. Some of you failed to do that. You left your peace in another place or another person. And you're walking around with that dust in every relationship, in every church you go into, in every business you go into. Some of you just got to wipe that dust off your feet and get back your peace. You know, if you got to call them back, no, you don't have to do that. But maybe you're like, yo, I left something there. My peace. I'm taking it back. I forgive you. (laughs) I'm not holding on to to unforgiveness because that's just going to turn into bitterness. And like Rick said this morning, it's kind of like drinking poison thinking you're going to affect the other person. They don't care. They don't care. So you can't live your life pitiful and powerful at the same time. Just forgive them and move on for your sake, not theirs. So you can be set free. So you can be reconciled. Sometimes the reason we can't reconcile the relationship that we're currently in is because of what we're still holding back in the past. Jesus said anyone that that puts their hand to the plow and and, and keeps looking back isn't fit for the kingdom of God. You got to look forward. Come on. Are you looking forward to what God has for you? All right. Well, sometimes we got to let go so we can let God. And so there's in the Mount of Olives and the olive branch. What's that, brother? Absolutely. It's all a matter of perspective. You know, God challenged us once. He said, Is it, isn't that why in, in the mirror, it, 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 you know, it's so small and it's so, so big and, and up front in the windshield. When you look back, it's always looking so small. But that's so true. It said, but, you, but why do you make such a big deal out of it? It's the past is the past. Stop looking back. If, you, if, you, if, that, if that mirror was so big and it always looks so big when you're looking back, then you would, you'd always get in an accident. You'd never be looking forward. It's a good word, Josh. <laughs> Thanks for the feedback. But back to the olive, okay? So the olive branch is one of the most well-known symbols of peace. Here's the Prince of Peace moving through a place of peace. And obviously it's derived from the olive tree in the Bible, the olive branch is associated. The olive branch is associated with reconciliation and the end of conflicts. Ho, oh, the olive branch. Check this out. I didn't catch this in the first one. The branch. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So attached to him, you being the branch, have a purpose for reconciliation and peace. But you can't get the peace without the Prince of Peace. You got to be attached to the vine if you want to have victory. If you keep trying to do it on your own, going out there, well, I'm going to forgive on my own strength. I'm going to forgive on my own grace. Good luck. It ain't going to work. Because there's only one vine, and apart from him, we can do nothing. And you know what I love? You can't be thankful and anxious at the same time. You can't be thankful and anxious. It's one or the other, right? Like I mentioned before, what you focus on is what you give power to. Thankfulness allows us to enter into the very presence of God and it unlocks the gift of peace. Check this out. Psalm 100 verse 4 says this. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. I'm telling you, sometimes we're praising things that aren't Jesus. Sometimes we're glorifying things that aren't Jesus. In the wedding ceremony I did too, I'm I'm like, let's talk about love. Love isn't just loosely used like a word like, I love chocolate. It's not going to get you, well, chocolate will help your marriage, but it won't get you that far. God is love. And everywhere I read in 1 Corinthians 13, love is a verb, love is an action. Right? It's not a feeling. And if you don't have the God of love, whoever does not know God does not know love. Whoa. And so we're, we battle daily with this feeling of anxiety, but we're told not to become anxious. Again, there's a difference between a feeling and becoming a feeling. That's why you're not what you feel, you're what you decide. 
and you're and hopefully you decide by who God says you are. But be anxious about nothing, it says in Philippians 4, 6 to 7. But by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests known to be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. It goes on to say, whatever is godly, noble, loving, true, meditate on these things. But you see, there's always a process to the promise. Thank God that the verse didn't stop at be anxious with nothing, because that's not working. <laughs> it's what do you do with that? How do I advance even when I have the feeling of anxiety? I choose to be thankful. I choose, and if you got to stop for a moment and pause in his presence and just list off the basic things like, yo, if you got a motorcycle, you have a lot to be thankful for. You know, maybe you have a roof over your head. Maybe you got a place to go, like here, like a great church that accepts you for who you are and is not going to judge you. And you can come into the very house of God and you can be set free, not set back. Come on. I mean, you look around this place and, and there are literally masterpieces that, all around this room created in the very image of God to do amazing things that he planned for us a long time ago, Ephesians 2.10. And everyone in this room was made in the very image of God, Genesis 1.27. So you're not sitting next to junk. You're sitting next to a masterpiece. There's greatness inside of everyone. And a relationship is probably our greatest reward that we have. And sometimes that reconciliation gives us back the reward. The very thing that the enemy meant to steal from you, God restores. So where do I need peace and reconciliation? That is the question. Where do you need peace? Where, this is where you write it down on the paper. I see some of you writing. That's really good. But some of you need to reach in front of you on the card. And you need to write down right now one thing, one word, one place that you need to receive peace and reconciliation. In Acts 3.19, it says, Repent then and turn to God, and your sins will be wiped out. The times of refreshing. Oh, there's the word. I asked for it. We got it. It's right in the scripture. I said, Lord, give us some refreshing. There it is. Times of refreshing may come to you. Can we read that again? Let's do that again. Acts 3.19. It's not, probably not even on the screen. You're going to have to look it up in your book. It says, Repent then. What do you got to repent from? What, if, what have you been holding back? What have you been putting in the way? Sometimes we just got to be like David and say, Lord, just search my heart. If there's anything that's getting in the way, let me know. Sometimes we're just naive. And I can't, I, I can't fix something unless I know there's a problem. And usually the problem's me. So repent, then turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Doesn't say turn to your friend, doesn't say turn to your neighbor, doesn't say, it says turn to God. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Repentance equals refreshing. There it is. It's worth writing down. Repent it's God's word. Repentance equals you know some of the things we gotta repent on is the way that you've been talking about yourself, saying that you're not good enough. I think, it, you know, my perspective of using God's name in vain is not swearing. You know, the greatest words in the world, the two most greatest words in the world are I am. The Lord said to Moses through a burning bush when the Moses like, who shall I say is sending you? Say, I am is sending you. And so when we use his name, his name is I am, is it not? And we use it out of context and we say things like, oh, you know, I am sick, I am fat, I am not good enough. He's like, yo, I serve the God of I am. You were made in his image. Why are you talking down about yourself? That's exactly what the enemy wants you to do because life and death are in the power of the tongue. My God is more than enough. My God is strong, he is mighty, he is wise, he is above all things. And I was created in his image and he don't make junk. So I'm gonna mm, stop myself before I wreck myself it's just that might be it that might be where you need to repent is like yo I've been really speaking down and trash about myself my relationship my family my financial situation like you just got to get to the word and start speaking God's word over your life like Romans 8 28 that says all things work together all things last time I checked in the Hebrew all things is all things all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and called according to his purpose I don't know. If you think of something right now that you just need to lay down so you can be refreshed, that you can repent of, write it down. Because we're, we're going to put that thing in the basket and we're going to let go and let God in a few moments. Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against the other person, 
You need to forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Grievance. If any of you has a grievance, like, oh man, just one? <laughs> I'm sure you can think of things if you just pause in his presence for a little time. You know, when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he's like, yo, why don't you just pray this once a year? No, daily we're supposed to pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, holy be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a good realignment every day for us to wake up not saying my will be done because his ways are higher than my ways. Praise God, Isaiah 55, right? His thoughts are higher than mine. I'd much rather have his way than my way. Even though my flesh says, yeah, you want it your way. You know, even um, there's a song. Who wrote that song? I had it my way. Who said that? Huh? Frank Sinatra. Let's not be like Frank, okay? <laughs> Let's have it his way. Because his way is better than our way. Right? But it continues to say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us. Come on, check this out. Forgive me my trespasses as I... Forgive those who trespass against me. Guess what? It's going to happen every day. But if you would start setting yourself up every day by praying that prayer, it really makes it a lot easier. Maybe easier is not the word. It gives you the strength and the power when somebody does something to you, but you've already prayed for that person. I love getting in the situation where, and not everyone's going to say sorry to you, but it is sure nice when they do. And they're like, yo, I'm so sorry I did that. I'm so sorry I said that. I admitted to do that or I acted that way. And I'll say, yo, no problem. I pre-forgave you this morning. No, seriously, your heart will be in a different position and in a different place when you face certain things in life. And again, it comes from a Christ perspective. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 21. All this is from God who reconciled to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry. Whoa. We got the ministry of reconciliation. So this right here in his word. That God was reconciled through the world himself, through Christ, not counting people's sin. Thank you, God, against them. And he has committed to us, say I, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Jesus's ambassadors. Through God, we're making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him, who was Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us. So that in him that we might become the righteousness of God. I know this is hard to take in. But Jesus, without sin, took on all your sin. And not just your sin, your neighbor's sin. And your enemy's sin. He took it all to the cross. Because the wages of sin is death. And the only way, how many of you know there's always a price to pay? If you do something wrong, you got to go before the court and you usually got to pay. If you get caught, right? And usually what goes around comes around. But there's a price to pay. And the wages of sin was death. And everything in the Old Testament foreshadowed what was to come to the New Testament. Sacrifice after sacrifice. Bloodshed after bloodshed. Passover, lamb. Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God that comes to take away our sins. Everything from the blood that was put over the doorposts of the home. So when the angel of death came over the house of every and took out every firstborn except for the house that had the blood of, of the Lamb over the doorpost. The blood of the Lamb, Jesus, blood was spread over the cross for our sins so that death would pass over us. There's significance in everything. There's significance in, in the blood. And you know, in the end of this, this chapter, we read that some of the Pharisees, you know, the religious leaders, the Pharisees that weren't fair, you see. In the crowd, they said to Jesus, they said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Right? Because they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And he said, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. <laughs> God will use someone. God will use something. Isn't it interesting that the stones are always at on the bottom? They're the base, they're the foundation. And Jesus was the cornerstone of this church. Sometimes we look at the things that are insignificant, but God sees significance in the things that we walk on every day or walk over or walk past. And they walked all over him. They did horrible things to him. But yet he was the cornerstone. 
And upon the revelation that he is Lord, he said, I will build my church and not even the gates of hell will prevail. He came in a way that people didn't expect. He didn't come as a warrior. He came as a prince of peace. Would you stand with me? Our takeaway is this, that I will lay it all down because he laid down his life for me. And if you're ready to be in that all-in moment with God, now is your time. Don't wait another moment, another day. Everywhere I go, everywhere I get to share. I'm excited to talk about relationship because it's all relationship. Jesus said everything hangs off this. Love God, love others. It's not about religion, it's about relationship. He came to start a relationship with you. He actually, the, the thing that he challenged the most was religion. He challenged culture, he challenged man-made religion. He challenged what people did and why they did it. He messed with the methods because again, he had a message for you. And that is that he loves you. And if you would just receive that message today, and just let go and let God. I'm telling you, Easter's going to be totally different for you than it's ever been. Maybe this is just your comeback moment where you realize that, yeah, I've got some coats. I've got some things that I've been holding on to that I'm ready to lay down. Whatever that might be, I'm going to lead you through a prayer right now. We're going to do just that. We're just going to let go and let God. For in Romans 10, 9, it says, if we believe in our hearts, confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in that God the Father raised his son from the grave that we'll be saved. You don't have to have it all figured out. You just got to come to a place just as you are. The scripture says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Nobody's good. Nobody in this room has it all figured out. The only difference is Christians are forgiven. <laughs> we ain't perfect. But if you just come to that place, trust me, you'll receive that peace. Let's pray together. We just bow your heads, close your eyes, and repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus, I'm ready. I'm ready to lay it all down. I'm sorry for where I messed up. I'm sorry for where I've sinned. I'm asking for your forgiveness. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose from the grave three days later. Come into my heart. Be Lord over my life. I receive your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Just stay in the moment, eyes closed in the moment. Just want to respect what the Lord is doing here right now, and it's pretty cool. First thing is that if you, when you just prayed that prayer, if you felt what I felt like, did you not feel peace? If you felt peace come over you, just put your hand up and say, yeah, that will hold. Yeah, okay, I'm not the only one all around the room. The next question is this. Uh, if, if you prayed that prayer and that was your first time praying that prayer, I don't want to embarrass you or call you out. All heads are bowed and eyes are closed, but not, just put your thumb up and say, Pastor, that's me. Yes, thank you. Put it up, put it up high. Yes, thank you. He's got you, man. He sees you. Yeah, she, he sees you, girl. Come on. Thank you. You know, I believe all my heart that you walk now with the Prince of Peace. Yeah, you'll have storms, the world says, but he says, take heart from this world. You will have trouble, but I have overcome the world. And I want you to know that, that what you feel right now, you can take with you wherever you go. When you, when you speak to God, he hears you and he's there with you. Just talk to him. Be open with him. Next thing I, I want to do is um, communion. If uh, you've never done communion, I'll just walk you through it a bit. First of all, it's for anyone that has a relationship with Jesus. If, if you just prayed that prayer, but you prayed that prayer before you invited Jesus to be Lord over your life, you're in the place for communion. And Jesus said that we are to do this often in remembrance of him and its significance, not something that we take lightly. And you know, biblically, if, if, if you look up communion, um, healing happened blessings happen, prosperity happen. You know, like, because why? Because it goes back to the keeping the main thing, the main thing. The bread represents his body. The juice represents his blood. And in Luke 22, 14 to 20, it says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles, they reclined at the table. I'll try not to get choked up about this part, but Jesus said to them that I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. 
Jesus knew, knew it was coming. When he spent time with the Father, it said that he, bled, he, he, he wept so much that his tears were like blood. He even said to the Father, if you can take this cup from me, take it from me. But he said, not my will be done, but yours be done. You got to think. He's eagerly waiting for this moment. A moment that we're about to share with each other and with him right now. And if you go back just over 2,000 years ago, yes, Jesus was able to endure the cross because of the joy set before him, but it was still difficult. And I think the hardest thing would have been not just eating with your friends, but knowing that one of those friends would betray you. One of those friends that would have communion with him wouldn't sell out Jesus, but would sell out, sell, sell out himself for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus offered up his life. For, nobody takes it from him. He gave his life up. But he would also know that one of his best friends, Peter, would deny him three times. He knew all this stuff was coming. With all that, and he would know that some of the people that were shouting Hosanna were probably the same ones that stood at the cross saying crucify him because they got paid to say something and do something that went against God's word. Because they put other things of value in front of Jesus. But he says, I eagerly await. He says, for I tell you that I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and he said, this is, take this and share it among you. For I tell you, will not, I will not drink, drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Verse 19 says that he, uh, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. So when you take the bread today, remember it represents his body broken for you. When you take the juice today, it represents a promise, a covenant, a blood covenant, a new covenant that you have in Christ. And know that he is making all things new. So as we worship, I'm just going to ask that you come down. I'll, I'll have... Um, um, Coach Bob and Sharon on what? Okay, whoever comes, that's great. They got it all figured out. But they're just going to hand out the elements to you and just take them at, at your own leisure with your friends or your family. You can take the bread, say a little prayer. Thank God. Take the juice. Thank you. Thank Him for the new covenant. And let's worship Him together. And the other thing is this baptism. Jesus said, Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey his commands, and surely he is with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Baptism is also very significant, and here at College Street, we don't make it difficult for people coming to God. It's not about a program. It's always been about a person. That's Jesus. In Acts 22, it says, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. I'll tell you this. If you can understand a relationship with Jesus and salvation, you can understand baptism. For in Romans, it says, when we go into the water, that we are buried with Christ. When we come up out of the water, that we are resurrected with Christ. If you want to be all in for Jesus and if you have not yet been baptized, now is your moment. Don't wait another moment. Just come forward. We got towels. We got clothes. My wife and I will be to the side and we'll be honored to do that with you. Let's worship God and take communion together.